Welcome to CME on ReachMD. This activity entitled, Pulse Points in Prostate Cancer, Embracing Advances with PARP-I Combinations, is provided by Access Medical Education and is supported by an independent educational grant from Pfizer Incorporated. Prior to beginning the activity, please be sure to review the faculty and commercial support disclosure statements as well as the learning objectives. Hello and welcome to this educational activity entitled Pulse Points in Prostate Cancer, Embracing Advances with PARP Inhibitor Combinations. I am Dr. Robert Mocharnik, Professor of Clinical Medicine at Southern Illinois University. I am joined today by Dr. Johan De Bono from the Institute of Cancer Research and the Royal Marsden Hospital in the United Kingdom, and Dr. Niraj Agarwal from Huntsman Cancer Institute at the University of Utah in Salt Lake City, Utah. Here is a disclaimer and disclosure indicating that we may be discussing off-label usage of approved agents or agents that are currently in clinical development. Here is our financial disclosure information. Here are the learning objectives for this activity. Dr. Agarwal, can you discuss the rationale for and current interest in combination therapy with PARP inhibition for the treatment of prostate cancer? Approximately 23% patients with metastatic castor-resistant prostate cancer harbor somatic mutations in DNA repair genes, with vast majority of these being in either BRCA2 or ATM genes. If you just look at the germline DNA, 12% of men with metastatic castor-resistant prostate cancer harbor germline mutations in the DNA repair genes, with greater than 44% of them being in BRCA2 gene alone. The most recent NCCN guidelines recommended germline testing for patients with prostate cancer that are at a high risk of rapid progression or have metastatic disease. Testing for somatic mutations in the homologous recombination repair genes is recommended, though, only for patients with metastatic disease. Additional details are shown in this table, which has been put together by the expert panel of the NCCN guideline for genetic testing. Let's start with the profound trial, which led to approval of olaparib, the first PARP inhibitor ever approved for patients with metastatic castor-resistant prostate cancer. In the PROFOUND trial, 387 men with metastatic CRPC were assigned to either cohort A or cohort B based on the presence of mutations in one of the genes belonging to the homologous recombination repair pathway. And this schema is showing those two cohorts here. Cohort 1 included BRCA1, BRCA2, and ATM gene. Cohort B has multiple other alterations which were included. Following assignment to either either one of these cohorts, these men were randomized two to one to either olaparib or physician choice of enzalutamide or abiraterone. Primary endpoint was radiographic progression-free survival. Prior treatment with a novel hormonal agent was allowed and stratification was based on whether patients had received prior taxane chemotherapy or if they had measurable disease. Please note that PROFOUND trial was the first positive randomized control trial in metastatic prostate cancer where patients were selected based on biomarker. Analysis of the primary endpoint was performed after 174 of 245 patients in cohort A experienced radiographic disease progression by independent radiology assessment or had died. Median radiographic progression free survival, as we can see here, was significantly longer in the olaparib group compared to the control group at 7.4 months with olaparib versus 3.6 months with the control treatment. The hazard ratio for disease progression or death favoring olaparib was 0.34. 
This translates into 65% reduction in the risk of progression or death on treatment with olaparib. In the overall population, the median radiographic progression free survival by independent radiology assessment was also significantly longer in the olaparib group compared to the control group at 5.8 months versus 3.5 months. At the time of final analysis of the overall survival, 148 patients of 245 patients originally enrolled, that is 60% of the patients in the cohort A had died, which triggered the analysis for overall survival, which was also a pre-specified endpoint. The median duration of overall survival was 19.1 months with olaparib and 14.7 months with control therapy with a hazard ratio of death being 0.69, favoring olaparib. This translates into 30% reduction in risk of death on treatment with olaparib compared to control. There were not many significant grade three or four adverse events. As we can see here, most adverse events were grade one and two. And in fact, if you look at the grade three events in the olaparib arm versus control arm, Pretty much all grade three adverse events were similar, except anemia, which was higher with olaparib. And it is a known class effect of PARP inhibitor therapy. For the sake of discussion, the most common adverse events, regardless of grades, were anemia, nausea, and fatigue with olaparib, and fatigue with the control arm. There were no reports of myelodysplasia or acute myeloid leukemia seen in the olaparib arm in this elderly patient population. In May 2020, based on the results of the PROFOUND trial, FDA approved the first ever biomarker-based systemic therapy for men with metastatic cancer-resistant prostate cancer after progression on a novel hormonal therapy and without requirement for prior exposure to chemotherapy with taxic. This was a very welcome step for our patients with metastatic cancer resistant prostate cancer who are harboring these mutations in their homologous recombination repair pathway. Based on the same findings from the PROFOUND trial, the European Commission also approved olaparib for BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutated tumors. So in, in men who are harboring these BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutated tumors and have had disease progression on novel hormonal therapy, also have access to olaparib in the European Union. So let's now move on to the next PARP inhibitor, which is rucaparib. Rucaparib was the second PARP inhibitor to be approved for patients with prostate cancer. So in the Triton trial, men with deleterious germline or somatic alterations in BRCA1, BRCA2, or one of the other pre-specified homologous recombination repair pathway genes were included. Patients who progressed on one or two lines of novel hormonal therapy with enzalutamide or abiratinol and one prior line of taxin-based chemotherapy for metastatic castor resistant prostate cancer were eligible. The primary endpoint here was centrally assessed confirmed objective responses per resist 1.1 or per PCWG3 for patients with measurable disease and confirmed PSA responses or more then our confirmed PSA responses of 50% or more for patients without measurable disease. So this trial uniquely incorporated endpoints based on either measurable disease responses or PSA responses. The confirmed objective responses for independent radiology review of the evaluable population was 43%, and the confirmed objective responses for investigator assessed review was 50%. Disease control rate, which includes stable disease and objective responses, was 88.7% per independent radiology review. This is a very encouraging news for our patients. We can look at this waterfall plot, which is showing objective responses. And we can see here that majority of patients are achieving some shrinkage of the measurable disease. And 60% patients demonstrate a more than 30% reduction in the target lesion from the baseline. In this waterfall plot showing PSA responses, we can see here 60% patients 
demonstrate a single best PSA reduction of 50% or more from the baseline. The confirmed investigator assessed objective responses were low for genes other than BRCA1 and BRCA2. For example, we didn't see a lot of responses in patients with ATM, CDK12, or CHECK2 mutations. Treat, if you look at the treatment-related adverse event of any grade, they occurred in 99% patients, and grade three or more treatment emergent adverse events were reported in 60% or 61% patients. The most frequent grade three or more treatment emergent adverse events were anemia at 25%, followed by thrombocytopenia at 10%. It was followed by fatigue in 9% patients. Overall, 28% patients received more than one transfusion of packed red blood cells. In May 2020, based on the results of this Triton 2 trial, the FDA approved Rucoparib for men with metastatic castor resistant prostate cancer harboring mutations in BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes alone. And these men have to have disease progression on a novel hormonal therapy with abiratinor or anzalutamide and a taxane therapy. So approval is different for, for olaparib versus rucaparib. Approval for olaparib is for men who have BRCA1, BRCA2, and many other mutations, including CHECK2, RAD5, ATM, and so on. And these patients do not have to have prior therapy with taxane in the metastatic castor resistant prostate cancer. For rucaparib, it is only approved for men with BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutations. And these patients have to have prior exposure to a novel hormonal therapy and a taxane in metastatic castor resistant prostate cancer setting. We also know that results from two other phase two trials evaluating monotherapy with niraparib or talazoparib showed clinical activity with an, with an approximate objective responses of 41%. Additionally, two phase three trials are evaluating combinations of APARP inhibitor with either abiratinon or enzalutamide in the magnitude and talapro2 trial respectively. So we are, we are going to see the results of these phase three trials where these PARP inhibitors are being combined with novel hormonal therapy in first-line castor-resistant prostate cancer setting. Thank you, Dr. Agarwal. Dr. DeBono, can you discuss the most recent data supporting the use of androgen receptor targeting in combination with PARP inhibition? So there are multiple trials ongoing studying PARP inhibition with next generation hormonal agents. These include combination olaparib with abiraterone, combinations of rucaparib and enzalutamide, niraparib and abiraterone, telazoprib with enzalutamide, and even veliprib and abiraterone. However, I think that we really have to wait on the outcome of these trials, some of which are really generally I think pragmatic combinations, trying to get the PARP inhibitors into earlier lines of therapy, which makes a lot of sense, because if we give these drugs early, we may get longer benefits. There is some evidence that PARP inhibition can sensitize um, to uh, ER targeting agents. Um, you know, there's some data published on that. Indeed, there's evidence that PARP inhibition can block AR transcriptional activity, although I think that um, these data would indicate primarily that uh, the effects of PARP inhibition are not tumor cell kill, but actually more cytostasis, tumor cell cell cycle arrest. There is some evidence as well that AR blockade may induce bracha although I would argue this is actually controversial and more evidence for that is required. The other thing that is, I think, per particularly interesting is that there is some evidence that when you get resistance to AR targeted agents, that you get alterations in the DNA of these tumors that actually result in sensitivity to PARP inhibition. So a new acquired um, re, you know, vulnerability in the tumor cell to uh, PARP inhibition that may reverse AR antagonist resistance. 
And this is some of the published data that um, you know are out there regarding um, these studies. You will see here that uh, in vivo combination in the MD Anderson prostate cancer model, one, three, three, four, four. I believe this is from Timmy Thompson's lab, suggesting actually that if you combine here and Zlutamide and Olaparib, you get increased antichimer activity. And that you can refer to this um, important paper in Science Signaling from 2017 that would really argue the case for this drug combination. There are obviously these multiple phase two trials ongoing, but the only data we have really supporting the combination in a randomized study is from a placebo controlled randomized phase two study led by Noel Clark, a urologist in Manchester in the United Kingdom. And Noel ran a randomized trial of Olaparib combined with abiraterone versus abiraterone alone. In metastatic CRPC, first line CRPC treatment as a randomizable blind placebo controlled trial. This trial was a uh, four to one center, 11 country study in North America and Europe. Abiraterone was with the standard dose and the lapper was given at 200 milligrams twice a day. The primary endpoint was investigator assessed RPFS based on resist. And one for two patients were randomly assigned 70 to one to each arm with no molecular tumor genomics preselection. The trial did show an improved radiographic progression free survival which uh, you will see in this figure here. This was published in Lancet Oncology by Clark et al. with a hazard ratio of 0.65, a 35% decrease in risk of progression. The 95% CIs you'll see here are 0 0.44 to 0.97, p-value 0.34. However, the study showed quite clearly there was no overall survival benefit. And my concern is that the RPFS benefit from this trial was primarily from the patients with a BRCA or DNA repair defect. The trial did show that there was um, largely no surprise with regards to tolerability, although there was some concern when these data were presented at ASCO about an increase in myocardial infarctions in the combination arm, which we haven't really seen with PARP inhibition before in single agent trials. The trial did try and break down in a subset of the overall population, the benefits in the DNA repair uh, defect group. And uh, I think it's really very hard to make any comments from this sub-analysis, which was really, I think, not well enough um, powered for any comment to be made here, and was, I think, largely post hoc. So the key questions that remain is, can we really justify treating patients whose tumors do not have DNA repair defects. I think we need more data to actually really uh, make this um, assumption. I think at present, the likely benefit from these combinations are primarily in the DNA repair defective group. But we'll have to see if the combination studies show an overall survival benefit, then I would personally be convinced that the combination is better than a single agent. But we'll have to see I believe benefits in the subgroups based on DNA repair defects, not only for the overall population, but for the DNA repair defect, in particular the BRCA and the remaining other groups with no DNA repair defects. Is the port cardiac toxicity a real concern? It is definitely a concern which will require more assessment. I hope this will not be a major concern, but we really need more data to clearly state what this really means for our patients that we serve. And it was gonna be quite interesting to see how these trials evolve. Clearly, a number of these trials will read out in the near future, Propel, um, you know, for Olaparib, Abiraterone, but there's also other combinations. Uh, for example, Olaparib, Pembrolizumab, trial that's ongoing that I'm involved with, um, which has some justification based on Olaparib causing double strand DNA break, cytosolic DNA, stink pathway activation, potentially that may sensitize to immune checkpoint inhibition. And this is partially based on work that has been previously generated by the group at the NCI led by uh, Professor James Gully. The other combinations we could talk about today are the Rucaparib combination, for example, Triton 3, uh, as well as Caspar. Then the Raparib studies, Magnitude and Quest. 
the telazoprim studies, telapro2, as well as uh, the viliparib trial, which I did depict here in the slide. Uh, thank you for that. Now, can you both share your clinical experience with PARP inhibitor and androgen receptor directed therapies and highlight a few prostate cancer patient case examples for our audience? So, if case of 48 year old man who was diagnosed with metastatic prostate cancer a year ago, the Gleason score was 5 plus 5. He also had a family history of breast cancer in his mother and an aunt. He received luprolide and docetaxel for six cycles for the diagnosis of de novo metastatic castration sensitive prostate cancer. And now has disease progression with new painful bone metastasis and liver metastasis. He was started on enzalutamide, but did not have any response to enzalutamide. In fact, uh, there was a PSA decline for maybe a month, and then PSA starts to rise again very quickly. So literally no response to enzalutamide. What do you recommend next? So these are the options. Pembrolizumab, abiraterone plus prednisone, radium-223, test for BRCA mutation, and if positive, starting olaparib, cell T, and I will just go through them one by one. Pembrolizumab is not approved for prostate cancer patients, except those who have a very small number of patients who have MSI high prostate cancer. This is not the case clearly in this uh, patient. At least we are not, we have not been told that. Abiraterone is clearly not an answer here because patient did not have any response or relevant response to a novel hormonal therapy, enzalutamide. Radium-223, and cipulosyl T, both would be contraindicated in this patient because of the visceral metastasis and also because of the overall rapid uh, uh, increase in the uh, PSA or rapidly progressive uh, prostate cancer. So obviously I'm going to pick up uh, test for BRCA mutations and if uh, positive, pick up olaparib. Now, this may take some time. This may take uh, two or three weeks, up to six weeks or eight weeks. And in this patient who has a rapidly progressive disease, I would like to keep a close eye. I would definitely make uh, have my nurse call the patient every 15 days and probably see the patient in the clinic at least once a month while I'm working on getting the uh, pre-authorization for Olaparib and getting the test results. Uh, for of comprehensive genomic profiling of this patient. Uh, having said that, I think the most appropriate therapy for this patient, if the patient has a BRCA1, BRCA2, or other DNA repair approved homologous recombination repair gene mutations, would be Olaparib. I would like to um, talk about a patient who did have a BRCA mutation. Uh, this patient was under my care for quite a long time. And um, he was diagnosed in 2003, a diagnosis with M1 disease, multiple bone mets at diagnosis. He had uh, ADT, which was a standard of care at that time, with a relatively short um, one year or so um, disease-free, progression-free interval, and then progressed quite quickly within just over a year of starting ADT with bicalutamide. Um, he then went on to get docetaxel and uh, did not get much of a duration of benefit with that. He progressed soon after starting docetaxel and um, came to my team um, and I gave him a clinical trial of a drug that was then known as a halicondrin B analog and is now known as eribulin on the phase two study of that agent. He did not respond on that agent and uh, he then got radium-233 since he only had uh, bone metastasis. This was again on a clinical trial. Clearly, this was in 2007, eight, before radium uh, was approved. What is quite interesting here is that in 2008, when he progressed on radium, we gave him abiraterone and he then had a three year uh, period of disease control, which um, really is uh, you know, pretty good for this kind of patient, although not unusual. He then progressed and um, 
he mentioned to my nurse that uh, he had just returned from a funeral of one of his cousins who had just died of prostate cancer. Now, this is way back in 2010, but at this juncture, we were getting quite interested in the germline defects. We sequenced his tumor in my laboratory. You found he had a bracket 2 germline mutation uh, 11 years ago, and we started the monolaparib. And what you see here is that uh, he really had a super um, response to olaparib. His PSA fell quite nicely. He was um, on olaparib for um, about three years or so, at the end of which he progressed only in the pelvis, uh, in the prostate, some small pelvic nodes, and one solitary left iliac bone mat, which we irradiated. And interestingly, after that radiotherapy, his PSA normalized and fell down to really pretty much down to zero. And he continued um, um, you know, to have a good duration of disease benefit. Now, why do I mention this? I think it's important to note that this man with a BRCA2 mutation really did quite poorly um, initially with regards to presenting with very aggressive disease, metastatic diagnosis, had a fairly short duration on an ADT before he progressed, but actually had a pretty uh, good response to abiraterol and a fairly good uh, period of disease control with olaparib. I guess now what we need to know is, is giving olaparib and abiraterol going to be better done together or is serially, as in this patient, you know, a better way forward for these men? But the answer to that will come from the trials that are now running. So, you know, I think that um, there's been much progress overall for um, serving these men with uh, advanced prostate cancer with new drugs and particularly um, these new AR uh, and um, PARP inhibitor agents. But I guess many questions remain. And doctors, can you recap for us which patients will most likely benefit from combination PARP inhibition therapy? based on specific selection criteria? This is a great question, Dr. Macharnik. As we know that we do not have any approval for combination therapies with PARP inhibitors for our patients. Of course, there are clinical trials going on combining PARP inhibitors with enzalutamide, such as TALA-PRO2 trial, or combining PARP inhibitor olaparib with abiraterone in the PROPEL trial. But we do not have the results on safety or rather say efficacy and safety of uh, these trials. I think these combinations are quite safe because phase three trials are already happening, but we do not have the data yet. Please also note that uh, these trials, large trials, many of these include selected and unselected patients, meaning these trials also include patients who are not selected necessarily for one of the homologous recombination repair mutations. So it is possible that these trials may show that combination of androgen receptor inhibitor and zalutamide plus talazoparib may be effective in patients who do not have these mutations, but we do not have that information yet. So I think that my answer would be to wait for those, the results of those trials. And if those trials are positive, of course, I'll be very happy to use the combination of uh, novel hormonal therapy with a PARP inhibitor in patients with newly diagnosed metastatic castrate resistant prostate cancer. That's where these combinations are being tested right now. I mean, from my perspective, the BRCA 2s are the ones that benefit most. And I think that's going to be the case for both the single agent and the combination, I suspect. I think that uh, there is definitely benefit for some patients with ATM um, loss. But I do think for ATM, we have to probably focus on protein IHC complete loss to see sensitization. And it's likely that this benefit is less than you see with the BRCAs. I do think that PALB2, RAD51, FANK A with bioleader class does sensitize the PARP inhibition and some other genes. And again, it's likely that for the combinations, these are probably going to be the combinations that um, going to be the patients that benefit most from the combination. There are clearly differences arising between Europe and the US. And in some ways, I wish that we could find a common ground whereby we had approval 
that was maybe a bit less broad in the US and a bit broader in, um, in, in Europe. But that's why we need a lot more data, I think, for, for, um, for prostate cancer patient, I guess, genomics and benefit from these agents. I think the other one final thing I would say is that we should not forget carboplatin. And um, if the, you know, the patient cannot access PARP inhibition, maybe in Europe because you can't have a uh, PARP inhibitor yet because it's not approved for, say, I don't know, FANK or you know, PALB2 or ATM, complete loss. I do think that these patients can benefit, and I've published on this, with carboplatin, probably single agent, AUC5 or 6 based on the EDTA, and this can really be quite beneficial for patients. From a global perspective, do you think there will be differences in clinical practices with combination androgen receptor plus PARP inhibition therapies? Should they become FDA and EMA approved? We already know that there is global variance in the practice patterns, despite drugs being approved, which are already approved uh, for patients with advanced prostate cancer. We know that in castration-sensitive metastatic prostate cancer, in many countries, their health system cannot afford uh, these uh, oral uh, novel hormonal therapies for majority of the patients. And in those countries, docetaxel is used more often in hormone-sensitive or castration-sensitive metastatic prostate cancer. Um, Radium-223, for example, is not even approved in many countries. So I, while it is approved and is used widely in United States, so I think it will all depend upon, first of all, the results on the efficacy of these trials, how strongly efficacious they are, how strongly positive they are, how what are the side effects? Uh, do the side effects of these combinations justify the use of the drug? Are, are they efficacious enough to outweigh, clearly outweigh the side effects of these combinations and the cost of these combinations? I think all of those factors will play um, network or interact with each other in ultimately deciding how these combinations are going to be approved and used in various countries. So very hard to tell, uh, predict upfront at this point of time. But I really hope that these combinations are beneficial because that will allow PARP inhibitors to move to first line metastatic CRPC setting, which is not the case right now. And do you think there is a role for combining PARP inhibition therapy with DNA damaging chemotherapeutic agents in the treatment of metastatic uh, castrate-resistant prostate cancer, given the fact that previous studies utilizing these chemotherapies have shown little activity? My short answer is no. These chemotherapy agents have never been tested, at least in my knowledge, in a large trials in combination with PARP inhibitors. We know that at least some of those agents, which may be used, especially platinum-based therapies in these patients, are also associated with significant toxicities, including marrow toxicities in this elderly patient population. We also know that PARP inhibitor as a class are associated with uh, anemia. We saw anemia to be a common side effect with, with olaparib, anemia, and thrombocytopenia, a common side effect of rucoparib. And now if you throw in chemotherapy in this mix, I personally think we are looking at uh, really intolerable side effects in our patients, elderly patients, the prostate cancer patient population. So I do not think there is any role for combining these chemotherapies with PARP inhibitors. And with the approval of PARP inhibitors, I have these agents available in my clinic. And beyond anemia, probably that is the only relevant remarkable side effect I can think of with PARP inhibitors compared to these chemotherapy agents, which have side effects way beyond anemia. We see anemia, uh, febrile neutropenia, uh, uh, severe nausea, vomiting, and just just so many other side effects, which are known to be associated with uh, agents like carboplatin, especially in the elderly patient population. 
So at this point of time, I'm happy that PARP inhibitors are approved for my patients in my, in my clinic, and I'll continue to use them, offer to them, and not use any chemotherapy agents unless there is a problem with access or affordability. You know, there's been a lot of work combining PARP inhibitors with chemotherapy like carboplatin, TOPO1 inhibitors, um, maybe even uh, TOPO2 inhibitors, mitoxantrone could, you know, could come to mind. My concern here is that uh, this sensitizes not only the tumor uh, to that chemotherapy, but also normal bone marrow and say the gut. Um, so I, I think in my experience, certainly for example, carboplatin combinations are really tough with PARP inhibitors. There may also be some merit in PARP inhibition with radiotherapy, which might be of interest downstream. And obviously there's the pembrolizumab, you know, PD-1, pd one trial combinations ongoing, which will be of interest, uh, although we'll have to see what those trials show. Thank you, Dr. Agarwal and Dr. Debona for sharing your thoughts. And thank you for participating in this activity today. You've been listening to CME on ReachMD. This activity is provided by Access Medical Education and is supported by an independent educational grant from Pfizer Incorporated. To receive your free CME credit or to download this activity, go to reachmd.com slash CME. Thank you for listening.